Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today is um, a very exciting session. We're going to hear from Mark Diesendorf and Rob Taylor. Um, but in a moment, um, I'll introduce them properly. What I'd like to do first um, is a little bit of housekeeping and very importantly, an acknowledgement of country. So first, um, my name is Michelle Maloney. I'm one of the directors of the New Economy Network Australia. A group of us co-founded NINA uh, many years ago and an amazing team of volunteers have been running and hosting and uh, driving the NINA activities since then. So um, really want to do a huge shout out to people who are NINA members and people supporting the New Economy Network generally. But today is all about um, Mark and Rod's fabulous book, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, Technological, Socioeconomic and Political Change. So um, let me keep going. Oh, so first I'd like to acknowledge country. Uh, this is actually a slide from a talk from last night when we were talking with an international audience. The big red arrow is to let you know that I now live, work and play in the beautiful lands of the Jinnabara and Cubby Cubby peoples just north of Brisbane. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and the emerging young people and um, others who are continuing their ancient traditions of custodianship and caring for each other. I'd also like to acknowledge that the New Economy Network Australia and the Australian Earth Laws Alliance are really committed to playing a role in decolonizing the way we think um, and care about country and each other in this continent. So to do that, I like to situate myself in the bigger scheme of things. To acknowledge country means really acknowledging that the lands were never ceded um, and to a personal acknowledgement of I am a descendant of Irish convicts who were brought here by the British Empire very unwillingly. Um, but I'm super glad that I am here on this beautiful continent. And as has become a bit of a Zoom tradition, if you would like to write in the chat uh, where you are, um, whose country you're on, how you're feeling today, anything at all, please do pop some hellos in there. And I think I normally show the next map. Yes, just a reminder that wherever you are, um, some remarkable and very uh, long lasting cultures have been here before us. So it's lovely to acknowledge their role today. Okay, so I wanted to just also mention that Earth Econ Economics for the Earth or Earth Economics Week is um, a week of events that we're co-hosting between the New Economy Network Australia and AILA, uh, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. AILA is my um, paid job. Nina is my volunteer job. Um, and every now and then their interests come together, which is really awesome. I do urge you to have a look at the website. If you've um, missed any of the events this week, we had a fantastic discussion, for example, um, with Daniel Christian Val last night, who wrote um, a wonderful book and continues amazing work in the regenerative design uh, and ecological design space and its interaction with all disciplines, including economics. Um, we also had a fabulous session with Anitra Nelson and Terry Lee, Lay, I always say his name wrong, on Tuesday night about degrowth. Uh, and also had a wonderful session with Indigenous elder Mary Graham sharing insights into the relationist ethos and what it might look like to think about economics from the point of view of Indigenous philosophy and relationist, relationist ethos uh, principles. But without further ado, um, it's my great privilege to invite Mark Diesendorf, who I've long admired his work for many decades, actually. And I'm sorry, Mark, that gives away the fact that you and I are a little bit older than 15. Um, but I've been a huge admirer of your work since the 90s when I worked at the Sustainable Energy Development Authority. Um, and Rod Taylor is um, a new friend. So I'm also looking forward to hearing from Rod. Um, I might let you both introduce yourselves more fully. Um, we've got your bios on the Humanitics blurb. Um, but our structure for today, oh, sorry, this is the advertisement. Don't forget, there's a Nina conference in November. Please come along. Yay. It's our first in-person conference for about three or four years, thanks to uh, Father COVID. Anyway, um, so now what I'd like to do is we're going to have Mark will um, give a talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have a short amount of time for just some questions of clarification. And then Rod will talk for about 20 minutes, and that will still give us heaps of time um, for lots of Q&A. So I look forward to hearing your presentations, guys, and um, over to you, Mark. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, thank you for hosting us, and thank you for all the fantastic work you do through Ayla and Nina and and beyond. This um, presentation is 
I'll try and summarize it in a few words, and then I have a slideshow to accompany it. So, but just to give you some background, I was originally trained as a theoretical physicist, but I, I broadened out and I've, I've worked for many decades now, must confess, in the areas of renewable energy and sustainability. And um, this book that Rod and I have written brings together a lot of that history in, in both our lives. So the book is The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, Technological, Socioeconomic and Political Change by Rod and myself. And the book to summarize is based on primarily on solutions. So we're not going to dwell on the disasters, although we, we have to refer to them, the potential disasters and threats. But in, in the nutshell, the book, the book focuses on solutions. But to get to solutions, we have to examine very carefully the barriers. And it's these barriers that I believe we must tackle as well as the individual issues. Now, I'm going to share my screen. So, yes, so at present, I'm nominally retired and I've never worked harder. I'm an honorary at the University of New South Wales. Now, you're all aware that we're facing existential threats to our civilization. And one of the most imminent threats is climate change. And we are currently experiencing as a planet. A few months ago, a few weeks ago, a few days ago in the Northern Hemisphere, we've seen some of the horrific impacts and our time is probably coming in the Australian summer again. Another existential threat that we're facing is the threat of nuclear war. And the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has advanced the hands of the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight. And that is purely on the basis of climate change and the threat of nuclear war taken together. So these are very real. The threat of war between the US and Russia or the US and China is very serious. And sadly, Australia is being dragged into that. And another threat that we're facing that Rod is going to develop is the increasing social inequality, not only between the rich and the poor countries, but actually within rich countries like Australia. And again, we have the resources to shrink that gap, given the political will, but most of those resources are being devoted to other areas, including the military. Okay, so right now, community campaigns are doing fantastic work on specific issues, climate change, pollution, resource depletion, deforestation, war, poverty, social injustice, and in, in ill health. But al although there's been enormous success, really, in many ways, we are still losing. And the reason we are losing is that we are not attacking sufficiently the driving forces which are res responsible for these events. And in our book, we've identified two main categories of driving force that we could actually tackle immediately. And the first is state capture by vested interests. And the second is the economic system, or at least the easiest aspects of the present economic system to push over which are neoliberal economics practice, neoliberal ideology, and the neoclassical economics theory that's supposed to justify it. So the approach in this presentation will be to tackle these one by one and to show how we as a community can focus on them. So state capture is much more than ordinary old corruption. It's really the capture of the whole nation state the government, the opposition, the public service, the media, and sometimes even the police and the military by powerful vested interests. And our captors include, of course, the multinational fossil fuel industry, the armaments industry, 
finance, property, pharmaceutical, and gambling industries. And also in the case of population, the Vatican. And last but not least, the whole economics, the dominant economic system. And I have to add that the captors may include foreign governments. And of course, the capture of nation states in this way is totally anti-democratic. And, and therefore, a movement for stronger de democracy has to be a movement to weaken the power of the captors. The most obvious example is the capture of the climate change issue and the, and the energy transition issue by the fossil fuel industry. And some of the indications of that capture, well, <laughs> the picture on the left-hand side showing the worship of a lump of coal in Parliament House, Canberra, is, of course, pretty obvious. But behind the scenes, we have retiring ministers of energy or resources from both major political parties appointed to very highly paid jobs in the fossil fuel industry or in the lobbying organisations for the fossil fuel industry. And that revolving door job situation works both ways. The door rotates in both directions. In the former administration and in Canberra, both the chief of staff and a senior political advisor to the previous prime minister were appointed from the Minerals Council of Australia. There are huge donations to, to both major political parties from the fossil fuel industry. So another example of capture of the Australian state is in the so-called area of defence. And here we have a situation where the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is an advisor to our government and is often uh, interviewed on the ABC as if it were an objective expert organisation on uh, foreign affairs and defence, that institute is funded by the United States government, the weapons industry, as well as the Australian governments. And here again, we've got revolving door jobs, which I won't go through now. But the most important thing to say is that now we know, thanks to an investigative journalist reporting in the Washington Post, we know that before Australia joined AUKUS and announced that it would buy nuclear submarines, five retired US admirals were paid by our Department of Defense to advise it on future purchases. We've also seen the expansion recently of US bases and um, the permission to nuclear weapons capable B-52s to be based in Australia. So we have to conclude that Australia's foreign affairs and defense strategies have been captured by the US military industrial complex. And in fact, foreign affairs in Australia now is dominated by defence instead of by diplomacy. Another form of state capture is, of course, neo-colonialism, where the global south is captured by the global north. One way is by the creation of sovereign debt, debt that the global south cannot repay. It's captured by trade that keeps them captive as a quarry or as a waste dump. And here Australia is a captive as well as being a captor in other areas. So how do we dismantle the methods of state capture? Well, we do that, and the community can in fact do, do that or exert enormous pressure on governments to dismantle state capture if it tackles the individual tools used in state capture. And you already have got the hint, uh, political donations and election expenditure can be controlled more tightly. Revolving door jobs can also be controlled. Concentrated media ownership, which used to be controlled in Australia, seems to be almost totally uncontrolled at present. And the Murdoch empire is, is totally dominating our news. Similarly, some of the think tanks, uh, which are funded very heavily by vested interests, and I'm thinking of the Institute of Public Affairs and the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, these think tanks can in fact be counted. And we must be very thankful to the Australia Institute as a think tank that is not uh, funded by vested interests, 
but works in the public interest and counters some of the misinformation put out by the, um, the think tanks funded by the minerals industry, etc. And so state capture, let me give you some examples of the results of state capture. And now I'm going to focus on conventional economics. That is the neoliberal economics ideology, which is an ide ideology of small governments, low taxes, decisions being left to the market, which really means in practice, leaving those decisions and programs to the 1% who actually control the market. And of course, one of the main myths put out by conventional economics is that endless growth in consumption of energy, materials and land, and in population, endless growth on a finite planet is possible and desirable. And the refutation of that is straightforward. We only have to look at the way Earth system science has shown the way in which we are exceeding planetary boundaries in climate change, in loss of biodiversity, in impact on biogeochemical cycles, in other words, loss of phosphorus and, and nitrogen, in, uh, in the loss of groundwater, the impacts on fresh water. We humans are totally dependent on these natural systems as any study of ecology or environmental science reveals. But, and we are destroying these natural systems that we depend on by growth in consumption. On the positive side, beyond a certain level, additional consumption doesn't improve happiness or well-being. There have been many surveys to actually uh, confirm this. And the other concern is that the growth in consumption actually delays the substitution of clean technologies for dirty technologies. And a good example of that is in the transition to renewable energy. From 2009 to 2019, that's a whole decade of growth of renewable energy, renewable energy has in fact grown at an enormous rate, a fantastic rate, with the result that, starting in 2009, fossil fuels contribute, contributed 80% of global total final energy consumption. That's all energy, not just electricity, but it includes transport energy and heating energy by combustion. So 80% in 2009, what is the role of fossil fuels in 2019, 10 years later? 80% of total consumption. Now that's no fault of renewable energy. It's the fault of the growth in consumption. And much of that consumption growth has been of course in the fields of transport and in combustion heating, but also to some degree in electricity generation. So renewable energy is chasing a retreating target and it cannot overtake fossil fuels and replace them by 2050 unless we end the growth in consumption. And that of course is heresy in the framework of conventional economics. So we have a situation that renewable energy is chasing a retreating target. Another piece of the neoliberal ideology that has huge impacts, adverse impacts on human civilization is the notion that we must shrink the government and the public service and leave the major decisions and programs to the market. Leaving to the market is the same as leaving it to the 1% who represent the vested interests, including, for example, the four big multinational consulting businesses uh, that have created such a scandal recently. But the important point to make now is that neoliberalism is ripe for pushing over. It failed disastrously, first during the global financial crisis and right now during the re economic recovery to the COVID pandemic. In each case, governments had to violate the so-called principles of neoliberalism, of small government, they had to spend, in, in Australia's case, hundreds of billions of dollars to keep the economy afloat. Neoliberalism failed. And yet, the government reassured us all that after 
the COVID pandemic, they would return to the old economic practice. Well, not if we can help it. So this is one of the very important ideologies of neoliberalism that we have to push over and we can push over. It has failed time and again. Another myth of neoliberal economic ideology is that wealth tr trickles down from the rich to the poor. And that's the so-called justification for reducing taxes on rich individuals and large corporations. Well, it's of course rich individuals and large corporations that are responsible for most of the environmental impacts, including climate change to a large degree. The vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions are produced by rich people and actually rich countries on average. Now, does wealth trickle down from the rich to the poor? In practice, the empirical studies show that this is extremely rare. For example, last year, a detailed survey of 18 OECD countries was published, spanning 50 years from 1965 to 2015, and it found that tax cuts for the rich, not only do they lead to higher income inequality, but also they do not have any significant effect on the usual indicators of economic performance, namely economic growth, if you believe in economic growth, or unemployment. Tax cuts for the rich do not work except to enrich, further enrich the rich. Okay, so what do we do all about this? Well, clearly, governments will not act unless they are really pushed more strongly. Franklin D. President Franklin D. Roosevelt once told the lobbying delegation, okay, you've convinced me. Now get out there and make me do it. And I think this piece of political reality really brings it home that lobbying lobbying decision makers is ineffective unless you can bring very strong community pressure against them and force them to actually take the kind of action that the community needs. Local community action has, its, has great value in terms of community education and community empowerment through local projects such as renewable energy cooperatives and other cooperatives and like many other people, I'm a member of several renewable energy cooperatives. But local community action has its limitations. It's the government that decides on infrastructure, on urban planning and land use planning, on pollution control, on energy efficiency standards for buildings, on public facilities, on taxes, on rules for banks, on rules for the electricity market and so on. So ultimately, although local community action is very important and very valuable, it falls short of what is needed now in this desperate situation. So what we are arguing for in the book is that additional community action is needed to form strong alliances between different community groups, environmental groups, social justice, trade union, peace, and public health groups. And these alliances with their greater strength can then pressure governments and business and industry to weaken state capture and to knock over neoliberalism. And we're starting to see the first movements in that direction. For example, the Australian Democracy Network was set up a few years ago by the Australian Conservation Foundation, a large environmental organization, the Australian Council of Social Services, obviously social justice organisation, and the Human Rights Law Centre. And they, in fact, produced an excellent report on state capture by vested interests. But as far as I know yet, they are not a campaign organisation, and that's what we really need at this stage. A campaign organisation that uses a wide range of tactics, nonviolent obstruction, strikes, boycotts, demonstrations, public education, media and social media, lobbying when you've got a lot of weight behind that lobby and sometimes legal actions. And community power can be very effective because we've got the numbers 
And what we lack and what we need is organization of those numbers into a much larger coherent forces through alliances between groups in different areas. And then success in weakening state capture, success in knocking over neoliberalism and challenging the foundations of conventional economics, that success will benefit all the groups, whether they are environmental groups, social justice groups, peace groups, public health groups, trade unions, you name it. So really that's the path that we are recommending for a sustainable future. And I, I guess one more thing that I probably should say uh, that we can enlarge on in the discussion is that, that we now must move towards a steady state economy. That's pretty obvious. And by that, I mean a, a, an economy in which there is no growth in energy use, in materials, in land, and in population. The fate of, the GD, of GDP is really unimportant, but it's to stop the growth in these physical things that we must do. And because there is a great need amongst the poorer countries of the world for continuing growth in all these areas, it means that the rich countries are the ones that are, are going to have to undergo planned degrowth. Not recessions, but carefully planned degrowth, which allocates human resources to the green businesses and activities that we need. And to do that, we have to constrain spending by the rich, because as I said before, it's the rich who have by far the biggest environmental impacts. And that means we need some, like many countries do have, taxes on wealth, taxes on inheritance, perhaps taxes on business class air travel too. And to do that, and we can expand in the discussion, we need to combine degrowth with an expansion of universal basic services, which comprise more public housing, public health, public education, public transport, childcare, aged care, national parks, and so on, so that people have a social wage and they don't have such a great need for a high monetary wage and continuing economic growth. So this is what, what a sustainable transition can offer to people to support it, that they will actually be better off. Everyone except the very rich will be better off if we combine environmental action with social justice. And the social justice path greatly needs the expansion of universal basic services. Now, these can be implemented within a, a market economy, but it's got to be a market economy with priorities of ecological sustainability and social justice. So the market has to be constrained. And the other uh, component of the transition, the social justice transition, is the job guarantee, which uh, we believe is really essential, where the federal government pays a basic wage to all unemployed people who wish to work. And the jobs are provided by all spheres of government and also by registered community groups. So the job guarantee is not work for the dole. Workers can leave or rejoin the program at will. And although I can see value in the alternative of universal basic income, the job guarantee is simply going to be much less expensive. And the job guarantee also has great value in smoothing out the economic booms and recessions, which universal basic income does not do. So to conclude, there may still be time to take the path to a sustainable civilization instead of following business as usual, which is leading to the collapse of civilization. There are pathways, but it's going to be tough. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry that the slideshow somehow did not work during that presentation. Me too. But thank you, Mark. Um, honestly, the slides were would have been a wonderful bonus, but we didn't need them because your talk was so clear. Um, people are already saying wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mark.
Um, in the five minutes or so that we have, just for a couple of questions before we turn to Rod's um, talk, um, <clears throat> there's two good questions that have already come in. Um, when it comes to the state capture and different organisations, et cetera, at that point, Jenny asked this question. Um, Mark, could you comment on the new organisation, um, Advance, which I understand, hang on, sorry, folks, which I understand is funded by US people and organisations, but appears to be behind the no vote for The Voice. Is this state state ca state capture writ large, surely? Do you, Mark, have any comments on a group called Advance? Well, I'm not familiar with the group. I, I know that they are pushing for the no vote. Um, I don't really see them as a, as a major part of state capture. Uh, I don't see the state as being totally captured on this referendum issue. What I see is a lot of misleading uh, statements and lies being presented by the no case, um, which is fairly normal in politics and very sad. And um, advance is just part of that that attempt. But what I had what I should say is of course we we have to investigate who are the which are the real organizations funding the no case. And I would suggest to you that they are the mining industry and the multinational agricultural industry. Uh, which are the industries that are, are represented by what used to be called the country party, but is now called the national party. But at this stage, it's a little difficult to gather that evidence. Clearly, the no case is seen as threatening to industries which, um, which do not wish to give more of a voice to our Indigenous people, to our first Australians. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Look, there's actually a number of other excellent questions. And if folks um, are okay with this, um, Mark and Rod, we're happy to have a more general discussion about these bigger picture issues because they will all take a bit longer. So thank you so much, Mark. We might now move to Rod and then we'll come back for a bigger discussion. And I'll keep collecting your questions, folks, and we'll cover as many as we can in the discussion time. So thank you very much, Mark. I'll take the spotlight off you so you can relax for a bit. I'll put the spotlight on Rod. No. Hello. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, dear. Thanks for joining us, Rod. And um, please do remember to introduce yourself and give some background if you wish. Um, we put that information in the bio for the booking page, but it's always nice for folks to be um, briefed on your, your expertise and who you are. All right, thank you, Michelle, and a big thank you for all the huge amount of work you're putting into this series of webinars. Uh, it's a great service. So my background is uh, I have a my first profession was in systems, so particularly in computer systems, but that affects the way I think about every problem. I always think about things in terms of systems, all the parts interacting together to form a solution, and that's just not the technology, but it's also the people and how people work together. And that's very much a part of how we put the book together. Uh, I'll just quickly say that uh, in 2017, I was uh, feeling increasingly depressed about the state of the planet. And uh, while I was earning a nice income as an IT consultant, uh, it, it, I felt I had to do something radically different. So I left my consulting work to write this book, uh, which was published anyway, that's uh, the journeys of seven environmentalists. They're a personal narratives, character studies, really. And then I was editor of this book here. Oh, I'll share my screen now. Uh, and I, I do that with great trepidation because uh, of Mark's experience just now. Now, please tell me you can see this. Yes, we can. Can you move the slides? That's the next trick. Uh, look at that. There it's we go. Working. Thank you. Okay. okay. We have the technology. We can do it. So uh, what, what Mark and I wanted to do with this book is th there's a lot of books that just talk about technology and all the the surface solutions to the problems that we are aware of, like a peak oil or climate change or species destruction. But you've got to dig down and ask the deeper question, what is it that's driving those things?
from below because, okay, sure, we could have more renewable energy, but as Mark's already given a really good description of state capture and the neoliberal approach to thinking about the word, the world, and that's not that's not going to end well. And uh, as Mark said, we're also very concerned about uh, the solution, not just running up a long list of unsolvable problems. So I want to now focus briefly on this word sustainable. And I think I'm pretty good, uh, pretty safe ground here to say that nobody who's tuned in today thinks that our civilization as it stands is sustainable. I mean, we've almost become numb to this word sustainable. You hear it thrown about all the time. But let's think through what the consequences of that are. And in fact, it's almost unthinkable. An unsustainable thing is literally something that cannot continue. Well, if our civilization is not sustainable, it cannot continue. And how long we've got before uh, we hit the worst, very hard to know. But, you know, the Club of Rome in the 1970s predicted uh, using their World 3 model that it could be sometime around the middle of this century. Well, where are we now, 2023? It's actually not very far away. Now, in my talk today, I want to focus on something that doesn't get much attention in the topic of sustainability, because I've said we tend to think about it in terms of the environment. Uh, we don't think about it in terms of the economy nearly so much, and not in the public discourse. A group like this, I think people are well aware that the economic system is what's driving our uh, our civilization to such a large degree. But uh, let's have a look at uh, at this. The so-called triple bottom line is not a new concept, but these three facets of our civilization are deeply entwined. And as Mark said, the neoliberal thinking puts the economy right at the very top of everything. And so they talk about GDP, everything's, oh, great GDP growth, that's what we need, more growth. Well, they, they forget about what underlies the economy. So the environment is a thing that serves up the resources. And when I say resources, I'm thinking it's not just about the habitat and the animals and the species, also the physical resources, particularly mineral resources, but things like fresh water. So neoclassical economics tends to diminish the importance of that or so-called environmental economics. It, it treats them largely as an externality, which means they can be ignored. Somebody else's problem. And in fact, you might have, uh, if you've read uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, there's a great moment and there's a, a packed soccer stadium. And down behind the goalposts, uh, an alien spaceship lands, but nobody notices because it's protected by somebody else's problem field. And that makes it invisible. And that's really how neoclassical, neoliberal uh, thinking works. And the similar thing applies to society. And that's what I want to focus on. Now, why is society uh, such a crucial part of the sustainable civilization? Well, here's a, here's a classic one. This is Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, Britain, the, uh, one of the great doyens of uh, neoliberal thinking. So in Brixton in 1981, the, the town was suffering from huge social problems. There was a racial profiling by police and, and uh, black people, immigrants, were randomly bailed up by the police. And there was huge resentment and not to mention a lot of unemployment, social disruption. The whole thing was a very parlous state. Well, Margaret Thatcher uttered one of the most silly things that I've ever heard a politician say, and there's a lot of competition for that prize, but she said, there is no such thing as society. So did Margaret Thatcher really think there's no such thing as society? Actually, I, I think probably she knew it is a real thing, 
what she was really saying is society is not important. That's a statement of values by her. And then the US Democratic Party, uh, Bill Clinton's campaign slogan was for, for re-election, it's the economy, stupid. Well, look at what the uh, uh, how dismantling a stable society, what it does to the economy. So in the Brixton riots in 1981, 300 people were injured and it caused seven and a half million dollars worth of uh, uh, pounds, sorry, of damage uh, in the uh, to the UK. And you could also think about it if you didn't really care about people at all, just look at what, what it does to the economy. It's a waste of human capital. If you think a person is nothing more than a human, that a, uh, a point of consumption and production, nothing more than a unit of production and consumption, what a waste. And, and look what people do when they are not happy. So is there no such thing as society? Well, you bet there is, and we forget that at our peril. Now let's have a look at countries around the world, and I think probably most of you are familiar with the work of Kate Rayworth, but uh, up in the top left-hand corner is her so-called donut. And what she's done is she's taken the planetary boundaries concept and she says, well, let's extend that to include society. So what she's saying is that a society or a, a, a nation or our civilization is not sustainable if we exceed the planetary boundaries. And by the way, I just saw an item this morning confirming that the... Uh, the researchers on the planetary boundaries say that we have now passed six of the nine planetary boundaries. So that's like running your car uh, without any oil. It's exceeding the safe operating limits for the planet. That's a very dangerous place to be purely from the physical point of view. So in this chart here on the right-hand side, that's the number of planetary boundaries. And there's the number six, if you can see it. On, oops, go back. Uh, number six. So this chart shows nations that have exceeded the planetary boundaries. And that's including us here in Australia and South Africa, Turkey, and so on. But on the vertical axis, we've got the, the social thresholds, or you could call them social boundaries perhaps and these are countries like vietnam or the philippines bangladesh so their planetary impacts is far less than they are of our wealthy nations or global north as mark was saying earlier so the the planetary impact of sri lanka is low but they're not meeting the needs of their civil of their citizens and so what this chart is showing is that this top left corner is where we need to be. We need to meet the needs of our people, but we also need to do it within the planetary boundaries. And that includes climate, water, phosphorus, and so on. And I said six of the nine boundaries that now have been crossed. Now let's look at this chart. And this looks at income inequality on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the, the generational earnings elasticity, which really means uh, how socially mobile or economically mobile people can be within these countries. So in the bottom left-hand corner, we have uh, a low uh, inequality in Finland, but, and a very high social mobility. But look at this country on the top right-hand corner here. We've got a high inequality and low social uh, mobility. So that's the low opportunity of people. Now, that's a recipe for being really unhappy if you're living in that country. So can you guess what country I'm referring to there? Because I blanked it out. Uh, I'll give you an another hint. This is a, a country that is in the midst of social strife. 
uh, climate science denial. Uh, it's in the grips of neoliberal thinking. This country is the United States. And we only need to mention the names of certain politicians and uh, the former president to know just how bad things can get. So if you think it's okay to have inequality and low social mobility, that's the kind of thing you've got to expect happening. But of course, United States, there's a lot more going on than just that. But this gives you one clue as to why we really must care about this question. Now, here's another example. And this one is that we use in the book. And we opened with the story of the Titanic. And as you know, about 1,500 people died when that ship sunk. But let's look what happened to those people according to where they sat on the decks. Well, first class passengers, uh, about 20, about 30% or 40% of the, of the first class passengers died, which means 60% or so survived. Well, not too good if you're in the third class or the crew, like 75% of the people died. So the social inequality has a very real impact and it's not something we can just ignore. Now, here's a, a more modern example, closer to home. The Woolworths CEO and Coles or any other big corporations, probably not that much different. This is the FIG Jam syndrome. Have you ever heard the acronym FIG Jam? It's F I'm good, just ask me. So the CEO in 2021, 8.3. Uh, million dollars in one year. That was their remuneration. That's a lot of money. And what is anybody going to do with that much money? Well, I don't know. But think about this in terms of the people at the bottom of the hierarchy. If you're a Woolworths cashier, you get on the median in 2023, $40,000. $40,000. 40, That's paying the rent, uh, the school fees, uh, food, getting the kids to school, you name it, that's 40000 That's not much money. And that's uh, one person. Are they really that good? Does one CEO really contribute 209 times the value of a cashier? Now let's look at the broader picture of society. So in this little rough picture that I've drawn you, the, the red dots are the wealthier people. And it's normal for a society to have inequality to some degree because you have to have uh, opportunities so people get ahead and some people don't do so well. That's always going to happen. But what happens over time is that the wealth accumulates and people use the wealth to uh, as a lever to accelerate their own wealth. And the more this continues, the more bifurcated societies become until you get this kind of island universe breaking off and what happens when that uh, occurs well it's an extremely dangerous situation for a society to face this now in my university studies i will remember we looked at why systems fail that was a fascinating topic which and it's been with me ever since and we looked at the Air New Zealand crash into Mount Erebus in the Antarctic and the Westgate Bridge disaster and also the Challenger uh, crash. Now, a common feature of co collapse when it occurs is you get this let them eat cake syndrome. So you get people who are detached from reality. So these people don't see what's going on uh, amongst the ordinary people. You get things like gated communities, people that you want to isolate yourself from all of those unwashed poor people down there. And it means you become detached from the reality of the decisions that you're making, when, whether it's healthcare or schooling or whatever. And a consequence of that is, well, if you're in this poorer group, uh, people get resentful they get angry. You might get violence, as I was describing earlier in Brixton. Uh, you get social decay. And if you only care about the economy, that's not a good outcome. 
But if you're in the wealthy group, how are you going to respond to this? Well, uh, with fear and control, because these people become a threat to you now. They become an other, if you like. And what are you going to do? You're going to have an autocracy. You're going to use state government surveillance. You're going to use excessive police forces, because that's the only way you can control this unruly group of people down below you who are causing you trouble. Now, so far, I've been talking about the importance of society as a practical problem, right? And in fact, if you if you talk to economists, they almost always use a utilitarian philosophy. And that philosophy says that we care about something because of the outcome of what you do. And so an example of that would be, oh, well, what's a national park worth in dollar terms? What is going to the opera or viewing an artwork? What's that worth in dollars? What's a person's happiness worth in dollars? And I was at a wealthy relative's place one day and visiting him was uh, an insurance salesman. No, not a salesman, an executive. And there was a crash of a passenger airline in India. And the first thing he did was he got on the phone and he wanted to know who was on that aeroplane because the dollar payout depended on who was on that plane. Now, is that really the way we want to run our lives? Do we really want to see ourselves as units of consumption and, and uh, production? Are we here just so that we can consume and have a materialistic lifestyle? Or is there something more important to being alive? Why do, you, why do we even exist? And that's a very adolescent almost kind of thing to say, but maybe that also reflects the maturity of our civilization and how we see ourselves. Things don't matter just because they cost dollars. All right, so with that, I would say thank you very much. And oops, some spare slides. Now I've jumped to the top. And uh, over to you now for any more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rod. Um, look, there's been some excellent questions coming through. So what I might do is I will put us um, back on spotlight. Hang on, so folks can see your lovely faces as you answer a few questions. <laughs> so first, everyone, um, I've been collecting your questions and um, Rod and Mark can also read your comments if they wish. Um, but I'm just focusing on questions at the moment. And a lot of them are coming under um, a gentle heading that I have grouped them under called, how do we actually make this change? Um, with your permission, Mark and Rod, what I'd like to do is actually read to you this list of all the questions people are asking. Um, you might want to drop down some things. And I think we can have a talk about all of this in one um, larger discussion, if that sounds OK. So um, here are the comments or questions. Corporations and their extremely well-paid executives are mainly not in the mindset for making change to a steady state economy or considering the environment. How do we change this modus operandi, um, which is presently running the world? Another one. Uh, this was for Mark. The only way your proposal for an alternative future for Australia could work is if you can persuade Australians to vote for it. Many cannot see past the Australian dream and the consumption levels that they have. Another question. Is there something about our culture that needs to change? I would say yes. Um, then another. How do you contribute to a change in spirit, in the spiritual, psychological sense um, that we have of needing to consume? And then another great question. Maybe this is impossible to answer, but how can we best act or agitate by honing one issue and going deep and persistent long term or trying to do as much as we can joining up the dots? There's so much to do. Um, personally, as someone who's spent 30 years in this area, um, I say all of the above, but you've just got to pick the one that you can do personally and then support all the others. Um, then there's some suggestions. Why doesn't every concerned citizen just go on strike, massing in city centres and demanding a new way forward? And then finally, in this collection of um, questions and thoughtfulness, um, don't we have to win the hearts and minds of as many people as well? We need to highlight courage, hope, passion and purpose. So turning to you now, Mark and Rod, um, and feel free to take your time and discuss this. It is always one of the burning questions, the ideas that people say, look, we can see this better future, but how do we actually make it happen? And 
actually, perhaps, Mark, um, you could start by picking up on the state capture. I do think that a lot of people in the NINA network are constantly saying, how do we challenge this powerful um, cabal between our governments and these big um, corporations and other vested interests? Perhaps start there and then flow okay. through. Okay. So uh, can you hear me now? Yes. And Excellent. Um, I should say that I realised later that I could have put up the uh, PDF and easily scrolled through that. Uh, always we realise too late. <laughs> instead of trying to click through the slideshow, because I have the PDF, which I've sent you, Michelle. I've got okay, it, actually, so, if you need it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, well, first, when we look at the size of the challenge, it helps to look at, at the successes that have been achieved and try and think about what were the, what were the elements of those successes. So there have been many great successes in social reform votes for women, at least in most of the world. Uh, the removal of support for slavery, at least official support for slavery, in pretty well all the world, even though slavery still exists unofficially. The expulsion of colonial British rule from India nonviolently. The civil rights movement in the United States. The displacement the removal of the Argentinian ger generals non-violently. And one could go on. And there's a whole list of successes. And those successes came about by a the growing strength of a community movement. And what we're arguing in the book is that individual groups, whether they're individual environmental groups or social justice groups, they're doing great work, but on their own, they're not enough to, to exert the force needed to, to actually weaken state capture and the economic system, which I see as part of state capture. And therefore, what we're recommending in the book is that social justice, environmental, peace, trade union, public health groups, at least the larger groups, devote some of their energies to forming alliances to actually campaign in much greater strength than the individual groups have on the issues of state capture, which are quite winnable. They have been won in some countries. They have been won, some of them have been won in Australia in the past. Issues like concentrated media ownership, political donations, elect election funding. Would you believe it? I did a Google search. Even some states of the United or disunited states actually have constraints on election funding. They actually have some public funding of elections. Um, it can be done. So there is. I went through a whole list of areas that, which are the tools used by the captors of state capture, and each one of those tools can be addressed by a strong community movement. It's, it's a strong community movement that would have moved Franklin D. Roosevelt to, um, to implement the requirements of the lobbying group that had intellectually convinced him. So, so that's really the first point I want to make. This is essential, and that's why I mentioned the Australian Democracy Network, and someone in the chat mentioned uh, a Hunter Valley group that's bringing together different community groups to exert pressure on a much larger scale. And that's what we need. We need, and as Rod has said, we need to bring together social justice and environmental protection. That's the strength. And what we're offering people is a better life with, with universal basic services on a much larger scale, not total state control. Markets can still exist. But, but that people will have the basics and a job guarantee. Uh, can I, I want to give a, a plug to the Citizens Climate Lobby, but they're a model of uh, an attempt to talk directly to people in influence. So Mark was saying in his presentation 
that uh, Roosevelt wanted to be moved by uh, the a mass movement, by sheer numbers of the population. But it's a combination of both things, of direct lobbying and the social movement working together. And the Australia Institute has just launched a program to assist climate activist groups. So a bunch of resources and things that can uh, help uh, climate activists. So have a look at their website. You want to know more about that? To be very clear. Yeah, of course. To be very clear, I'm not speaking against lobbying. What I'm saying is lobbying is going to be much more effective if the lobbyists have behind them the weight of a very large alliance of community groups. And that's what, what we need. Right, and a pinch, a piece, of, just, move, a piece you, of movement. <laughs> yeah. A purely intellectual convincing of a politician, unless they happen to be perhaps a Green or one of the Teal Independents, purely intellectual con convincing is not usually going to move anything. But if there is a weight behind lobbying, then everything changes. And if governments feel that they're going to lose seats and lose votes, if the major parties are going to lose to an independent or to a green, they'll start to listen. If big business feels it's really going to lose sales on a large scale due to community boycotts, then they will start listening. I mean, Qantas, there's an opportunity now to put enormous pressure on Qantas to really act not only in the interests of the shareholders, but in the interest of, of its passengers as well. And um, But then you can also say, but we also have to change the economic system that produces corporations whose only interest is in, in the shareholders. Right, do we have another question that you wanted to do? You're muted. Sorry about that. I'm looking at the one where I grouped several together. I might pluck out a few key points while we're talking about how do we create social change. Um, there were two questions that are sort of uh, similar. One is, is there something about our culture that needs to change? And then the other question was, how do we contribute to a change in our spiritual and psychological sense that we need to consume? So culture and the sort of the, the linked, the spirit, the psyche, consumption can I, I i kick off on that one so really as i was saying in my presentation a moment ago what's really important is are the values that, that we hold and if as long as we hold material possessions and money as being the highest value then we're in real trouble changing people's values is one of the most difficult things and uh Michelle, your background screen has got a strong Indigenous flavour to it. And I believe it's from the Namajira school you were saying earlier. Uh, we should look at what the Indigenous people around the world, how they treat their country, and they are deeply embedded in their country. They know that without that country being in a healthy state, that they've got, that they can't survive. So, but if you threw one of us into a paddock, and you said, oh, okay, you, there's no shop, there's no cafe. How long are you going to survive? Not very long because for us, food comes wrapped in plastic from the supermarket. And that's disconnect from the natural environment is extremely, uh, uh, it's a dangerous thing because we take it for granted. So if I buy food that's um, grown unsustainably or a mobile phone that's built using slave labor and resources that can't be renewed, well, I can't see it because I just go to the shop and I buy it. So the, the sense of the values is really important. It could be spiritual. if I think spiritual, not necessarily religious, but a spiritual sense, I think, is something that we really need to acknowledge. Thanks. If the questioner, I'm just wondering what the questioner means by our culture, uh, because if they mean the dominant white culture in Australia, then... We are very backward, even compared to other dominant white cultures around the world. The absence of a treaty, for example, with our indigenous people is 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 one example. Um, so um, the lack of a voice. Um, some dominant white cultures in Scandinavia, for example, give a voice in Parliament uh, to their indigenous people. So I'm afraid we are rather backward. Into, we, if we mean the 
the white, the dominant white culture. Uh, we are rather backward in this country, but we have the possibility of change. Mm. And I just wanted to add it. Thank you, Mark and Rod. And Rod, what he's talking about, well, firstly, actually, the image behind me is created by artists that we worked with. The Namajira like uh, image is behind Mark Diesendorf over his right shoulder. Um, so just to make sure, I don't want anyone thinking that I said that our Green Prince artwork to promote this beautiful postcard from the future is a uh, Namajira style. It's definitely not. Um, but yeah, someone's already mentioned we've had a we work with obviously closely with Indigenous elders and friends in uh, Ayla, Nina and Future Dreaming. And Mary Graham is a wonderful voice for what the relationist ethos and Indigenous culture and philosophy and governance in this country invites us to do, uh, to grow up, to be more mature, to understand place. And she refers to the governance system that existed prior to colonisation and which much of continues in many places despite the disruption of invasion as a... Uh, sacralized collaborative ecological stewardship system uh and um yeah i just think that the way that she frames what the relationist ethos can offer the future for people thinking working and living in australia um it's pretty strong so i do recommend for anyone who's interested in mary's work or other events we've had throughout this week check out the websites the recordings are going up as we speak mary spoke about the relationist ethos and how we would reflect that into economics um, on tuesday this week uh, but some more questions um so we've talked a little bit about what it might take to make change and it's really um i really love these suggestions in your book mark and rod about having different groups come together and try to forge stronger uh, allegiances and alliances um a couple of people have mentioned some very specific groups uh, i just want to give credit so i think it's jess has mentioned the queensland community alliance brings together churches unions ethnic groups community groups and others working to uh to come together um, we've mentioned the hunter um there is a specific question about the politics of making change. And I, I was wondering if you would both like to delve a little more deeply into, so let's pretend we get all these great community alliances happening. What can they do specifically to work with their local members to either introduce laws, to change laws, to make reform? Um, so one question is, but don't we need a majority crossbench to change laws regarding donations and that revolving door? Did you want to talk a bit about once we get those community alliances or those stronger groups, then what? I, okay, I would just kick, I'll kick you off. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> I'll give you time to think of your answer, Mark. Yeah, good. <laughs> I, I think it's really important to understand the motivations of a politician. So what do they care about? And I was coached years ago by a, a guy who was a very high-powered marketing guy. And he said, a good salesman always asks lots of questions. So in the lobbying that I've done with the Citizens Climate Lobby, we always ask lots of questions. And it's the question that, that tells you what that person cares about. Because if you go in with a bunch of solutions, and but they don't address what that person cares about, then you're not going to get anywhere with them. Mm. And so the questions I'm, I reveal that for you. But another thing is that Mark has, has said this, is we often assume, especially those of us with a science bent, that uh, people are rational. Actually, people are not rational. And uh, Mark might comment on the behavioral economics, but there are countless examples of where people do things that are not in their own rational self-interest. And I could uh, draw, for example, the... Uh, People who vote for the former US president think that, they, that that person could possibly make their lives better. And that's kind of a clue to the second part of the question, that is uh, humans are very tribal in nature. So I passed a bunch of cars parked a few days ago and they've got those big red Australian flags and I think they're called cookers, aren't they? I don't know why, but they're against the voice. They vote, they vote no. And I think a large part of the reason why they, they do that is because they're tribal. So you've got to understand the logic of uh, politicians. You've got to understand why they respond to tribal behaviour and you've got to understand what motivates them, Mark. Okay. So I think, um, Rod, you referred to a pincer approach and I certainly think that we need a two-pronged approach 
to social change. And one of those prongs is lobbying the right politicians with the right amount of force behind it. So lobbying them with the ability to, to, to basically make them lose their seats if they're hostile or to increase the number of seats of people who are of potential politicians who, who are willing to go along. And I would say in this regard that there is huge potential to increase the cross benches, to increase the, the number of uh, independents and Greens in Parliament. And uh, But there's also an issue of educating the independents because many of them come from very privileged backgrounds and need to learn about the real needs of the majority of the population. And, and some of them are starting to do that. So that's, that's one prong. I, I wouldn't waste my time talking to most uh, members of the coalition, quite frankly. It's, it's a waste of time and time is valuable. Um, Labor seems to be mainly focused on getting re-elected and there's no guarantee that they'll do any more, even if they, if they are re-elected, than trying to keep in the centre and try to minimise the attacks on them from the Murdoch press and so on. The other prong is focused on community action and building that strength in the community until it is really unstoppable. And, you know, one sees the seeds of those movements uh, growing. And that's that's really how some of the great social reforms were achieved. The ones that I listed before, uh, although it takes time to build that strength. But I think that's that's really important, that, that we need to spend much more time organizing because look let's let's just examine the situation from a sort of political science point of view the strength of the vested interests is in their wealth which leads to political power but their numbers their weakness is they're very small in numbers and so they try to expand their numbers by lies and propaganda and so on the strength of the community movement potentially is in its numbers provided they are well organized. And, and that's really the, the crunch of the whole thing. It's not enough to have lots of people on your mailing list, and some organizations have huge mailing lists, but they actually have to be organized in a way that they can come together and, and do things when, when it becomes necessary and really make those numbers felt. Like there's a the good comment just came in through the chat then, and someone, uh, Paula, has said, uh, isn't there a danger of disenfranchised liberals turning into the, into an authoritarian fringe party? Uh, and I think there is a kind of a self-reinforcing loop that the Liberal Party has got into. Oh, we've just got a screen. Yeah, well, this, oh, this yeah. illustrates... I, I agree, I, I agree, I agree uh, with Mark that we need a combination of both uh, mass community action and targeted action. But what's happening to the conservative parties is that uh, if you had a, any progressive bones in your body, why would you want to join them? So it's sort of becoming, it's like the diagram I was showing on my presentation a moment ago, it's becoming a, a self-reinforcing bubble. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for putting up that slide, uh, because that's one of the slide I, I used to illustrate the power of organised community with the uh, the fish. That's why I brought it up. I use that one too, and I think it's lovely um, that we do have the numbers. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to give you a fright rod. I should have mentioned. I do that occasionally. <laughs> if, if speakers refer back to something they're doing, I assist. I'm putting comments in the chat about how to get your book, and I put up that slide, and I didn't mean to frighten you. Um, but so thank you for that. You're talking about how to influence your um, perhaps your local members and such, but there was a lovely comment. It's moved on now, but someone said, aren't they supposed to be interested in what we're interested in? I mean, it is a strange political game that we have to think like a, perhaps in some cases a person with very different values to our own to try to bring change in our own communities or through our representatives into parliament. But I guess that's the nature of a diverse society. 
Um, there's actually a couple more questions that I've gathered around some very specific areas and sectors, which is really worth discussing. So in a way, we've already been talking about how do we make this change? You've talked about community organising, talking to politicians. Um, this is a great question. The present Labor government and the previous coalition are promising lots of jobs in military and war making. How do we stop that campaign that is now that is even now being brought into schools and universities? The militarization. I mean, they're very much one of the uh, groups that have done the state capture very effectively. How do we challenge that? Do you guys have thoughts on that? Well, we certainly have to speak out much more loudly about what's going on and not leave it to the so-called experts, such as the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And one would hope that the ABC would see a bit more sense and, and realise that they are very much a, a vested interest that is funded by vested interests. So the situation I would, is pretty grim. I mean, it was bad enough before AUKUS, where Australia has followed the United States military and industrial complex, which rules the US government on foreign affairs, um, into a whole series of pointless and destructive and horrible wars, you know, you're running through from, from Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, and we really have to resist very strongly uh, being dragged into a war with China. As I think many people here listening know, the original idea of diesel-powered submarines was chosen because they are actually the most suitable kind of submarine, if you're going to use a submarine, for defending Australia's shores. Nuclear-powered submarines are the most suitable kind of submarine for trying to contain China in the, in the South China Sea, which is a really impossible task, a stupid task, to try and attempt. And because China is essentially now an economic power of the same strength as the United States, depending on how you measure economic power, it's it's more or less the equivalent. Yeah. And it will not be contained in that way. Yeah, and the, 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 the thought of a conflict with China is almost, um, it's almost unthinkable. One thing I would like to do is to expose the lobbying more so make it more visible because it all happens behind closed doors. And there's an article in the paper today or yesterday about a, a private lobby uh, for in the Qantas lounge where only invited politicians and people can go and no one else can get in there. And we've got to make that kind of thing more visible. Yeah, I think alternative media uh, are doing a good job and, and they've got a very important role to play. and alternatives even just to the, the Murdoch empire are very important, like the Guardian and the Saturday paper. Uh, some of the uh, alternative websites are really publishing lots of fantastic stuff. Um, I refer to pearls of, and irritations. Sometimes the conversation, although it's a much more conservative body in terms of its choice of articles and it is rather ruled by conventional economists in the economic sector but one can occasionally get uh, an article there and it has a much wider readership than say pearls and irritations can i just um so you're saying pearls and irritations yes okay I'll, I'll pop that in the chat and just while i think of it someone asked earlier on i think it was william um has anyone got a link to the state capture report that mark just mentioned um mark yes. did you do you have a link in your slides that i can pop, perhaps copy and pop in the chat for oh. people or it's easy to find you just go to australian democracy network okay australian democracy network and you will find their report on state capture very yes. easily i'll try well, to find it while you keep chatting while you're doing that, Michelle, I'll, I'll just quickly mention that uh, I didn't say in my introduction that I'm a science columnist with, uh, formerly with Fairfax, now with Australian Community Media. And I did a column about a year or two ago about how much water does the Adani coal mine in Queensland use. And it's the only time I've ever got a formal complaint from, a, from somebody. And guess where that complaint come from? They threatened to take me to the press council 
and I and I'm very proud of this that that the Udani company uh, tried to take me down, and I can. It was pretty mild. It's pretty mild, uh, but uh, and I had to put in a correction. But it's very intimidating to get something like that. Yes, it's a standard. It's a standard tactic of powerful organisations to either threaten legal action, even when there's no basis for it, or actually to take legal action. And many years ago, when I was a young campaigner on climate change for the Australian Conservation Foundation. I was sued along with the Australian Conservation Foundation uh, by a consultant to the coal industry who had written an article in the paper. And in a letter that I'd written to the paper, I simply pointed out that he was a consultant to the coal industry. And that attracted um, legal action against us. Um, now, legally, our advice was that they couldn't possibly win but it would cost us a small fortune to defend ourselves. <laughs> and fortunately, they settled out of court uh, for a, an, a trivial sum. But it's a real dangerous tactic that is used by many large corporations. It's called a slap, um, strategic litigation, litigation against public participation. Yes. And this is this ongoing theme, the unequal resources that large groups have over the smaller community groups, which is why you're talking about bringing folks together. Um, back in the days when I was more like a lawyer than I am now, watching companies drown people uh, in information when people would challenge their, you know, their actions and they would just win by the war of information, just overdose them on too much. People can't get through it all. People have no equal resources to challenge those things. Um and I was just going to say, you were talking a bit about this alternative media um, that actually links to the next question about the how we challenge this state capture. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, how we continue to challenge the Murdoch press and other areas um, while certain protests are becoming more, um, are becoming labelled as illegal or not appropriate um, with the media and particularly Rod with your background. What are your thoughts on how we challenge that aspect of Australian discourse? Uh, it takes a great deal of bravery, and I really admire people like uh, Julian Assange and, and uh, people who whistleblow. Well, not many people are prepared to take that kind of risk. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's the short answer. It's a tough uh, one. Yeah, it, it, it is a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that media, sorry. Yeah. I'll just say whistleblowing is quite dangerous and their protections aren't great. Uh, but there is an association called Whistleblowers Australia that was started by my friend Brian Martin many years ago. And, and that can at least give support and information to, um, to people who are willing to speak out. And and I think the principle, though, is that exposure is what the vested interests do not want. And if you can expose them without setting, you set up, set, without setting yourself up to be sued for defamation and talk to a defamation lawyer, and there are forms of words that you can use that generally will avoid defamation. You can say, for example, it is my personal opinion that this corporation is scamming the public, pub, the population or their customers, and saying it's a personal view weakens the ability of them to actually sue you. And I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but there are various ways of exposing situations that need exposing while not exposing yourself as much as you would if you just jumped in blindly. <clears throat> Thank you. Someone's just asked, Michelle, will there be a link? Um, can you perhaps put in the chat exactly what you want the link for? I did just put in the link for that report about the state capture. Um, but if you're talking about something specific, please just pop it in the chat and we'll see what we can do. All right, there's some more questions. Let's keep going. Hooray. Um, so someone's actually suggested, you know, why doesn't every concerned citizen just go on strike? massing in city centres, um, and then someone else has asked, why are Australians so apathetic? 
Can we perhaps talk about this together? Because we are talking about, you know, let's put it all back on the communities. The communities will come together and they will make the change because governments can't and won't, they're not willing. What does it look like in a country like Australia where protests are not hugely popular amongst the masses? Uh, can I refer to the one of the slides in my talk, and that was the, the, the bubble where people become detached. And in, in a sense, Australians are a bubble on a global scale because we're doing very nicely. Uh, on the on the whole, and it's really easy to detach from the the bigger picture. So you know, I got up this morning, had a nice breakfast, coffee. I've got a comfortable house. I sat in the sun. So um, the the idea of global warming and the terrible things that are happening in the flooding in other places, I'm that's you know like that's somebody else's problem field. I can't see that going. I'm doing very well, thank you. So it takes a leap of imagination or uh, abstract thinking to because I'm not seeing that firsthand and I remember there was a report about a huge coral bleaching event in the Indian Ocean once and I got up in the morning I'm like well sun shining you know I've got a, day, a great day ahead of me you know what's the problem so uh, we're all complicit in this there is a, um, I think there is a cultural problem in Australia that is not shared by many other uh, regions and countries around the world, and that is that it's generally regard regarded as bad form in the public arena, in the pub or the cafe, to talk politics, for example, or to talk religion. Hmm. Not that I want to talk religion right now, but in Europe, for example, it's normal for people to, to discuss politics in public uh, It's as part of the conversation. And I think that that restriction, that cultural restriction has been fostered in Australia by vested interests, you know. Um, and you even see it uh, in the advertisements, the really outrageous advertisements where you see a group of people um, uh, getting into an awkward situation and then someone says um take my money let me let me bite into um some horrible junk food product and that will solve the problem i know which one you're talking about i'm not going to name the horrible junk food commercial but i have seen it <laughs> once and it's got shut up and take my money that's and right it's, it's silencing and, any and, discussion <laughs> oh, God, but well, to be positive i think that that yeah. cultural um inhibition is changing particularly in Australian cities and people are beginning to talk about public issues about politics much more willingly it may be rather different in country towns I'm, I'm glad you mentioned marketing Mark because so years ago there was a big ad on the side of a bus and it said this ad is for the most important person you so there's this real tendency for marketing to focus on self-gratification and narcissism. It's all about me because I am the most important thing. Well, we are in such a dangerous moment in history that uh, no one person can, can solve the problems that we are facing. And that kind of leads to a question that all of us who are working in environment science communications, and that is how... How do we frame the message of the environmental crisis? Do we talk about collapse? So the other day I was in a session and someone said, oh, yeah, but you can't say that because, you know, that's we've got to give people hope. Well, uh, you know, if you had a cancer diagnosis, would you, would you want to be not told because it was bad yeah. news? So it's really tricky. To, to how we talk publicly about the, the the depth of the crisis that we are facing, but it is really serious and it, it is right here and it's upon us uh, and we have to face up to that. Yeah, uh, look, a, a particular example is that people are still talking about uh, meeting the climate target of keeping global warming below one and a half degrees. Now, at this state of the game, it, that's totally impossible and it's ridiculous. And I do think um, we have to say, look, it's going to be a struggle to keep below two degrees now, a real struggle. And just forget about one and a half degrees. Now, some people would say, oh, you shouldn't say that, Mark. 
because it destroys hope. Oh, I don't think so. We just have to direct the struggle to what is reasonably possible. And right now, two degrees might still be possible. One and a half degrees is gone. Honestly. Well, we don't we don't know that one and a half degrees is safe, and there's fair evidence that it's not safe. Uh, two yeah. degrees is 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 terrible, and yet politicians treat it as if it were a negotiating position. Oh, I can't do one and a half, but I can do two. Well, the climate, the planet doesn't care about your negotiation. It's physics. It's going to go ahead and do what it wants, regardless of what we negotiate. Thank you. Well, um, just a couple more things. We've got a couple more questions here. We're doing very well. Um, I'm just going to come back to one of the questions that I rattled off in the sort of general ones about how to create change. Then I'm going to move to, if it's okay, a couple of very specific questions around job guarantee, universal basic income, universal basic services. So let's move to that in a moment. Um, but uh, the question, um, how can we best work or agitate by honing one issue, go deep and persistent long term, or try to do a little in many areas and joining up the dots. Um, so much to do, so few of us really looking at this massive challenge. Can I just take the opportunity as a Ninaite to say, we all believe in the work that we do, that all of those approaches are important, that some folks, whether they're science understanders uh, or activists have to go deep into a topic, whereas others have to play the role, as we do in Nina, of just bringing more and more people together to raise the profile of conversations. Um, but what do you think, Mark and Rod, about the approaches that are effective? I, I, I agree with you, Michelle. We have to do both. It's too late to, to focus on one or the other. We do, we do, but also we have to focus our energies, no pun intended, on the things that make the biggest difference because there are 20 nasty people coming at you with spears and clubs. You can't do deal with them all. So you've got to, you've got to prioritize. And uh, so really, I think it's really important part of the book from Mark and I is we need to unwind the neoliberalism uh, model, the neoclassical economics and the state capture. They're really the things I think, Mark, if you agree, they're the, and, they're the number one things. Yeah, and really we're being very, very cautious in the book. We're not saying we have to throw over capitalism straight away because that may, that may not be such an easy task. But we are saying neoliberalism is tottering already and we really need to stand up and push because it will fall over. And I, it's inevitable it will fall over, but it has to fall over now. And that's the first step. And neoliberalism is being justified by neoclassical economics theory. And I'm part of an international team that's trying to publish a paper, a team of scientists and economists, that's saying neoclassical economic theory, at least as it applies to macro economies, the whole nation, is just nonsense. There is no scientific basis for macroeconomics as it is taught in universities today. And we're trying to get that published in a major paper, in a major journal. And well, um, so that's one of the things that, so what we're saying is really, if we can attack the dominant economic system and the vested interests, and these are really related things, these well, are not diffusing our energies because such, if we can weaken these interests, that will benefit all the special interests. It'll benefit climate change. It'll benefit um, groundwater loss and soil loss. It'll benefit poverty. It'll benefit peace. But we have and, to get uh, onto these vested interests and we have to get onto the economic system and weaken it as best we can. One of, one of the most visible uh, outcomes of this type of thinking that uh, Mark and I are talking about is population. So we haven't really said a lot about population. Oh, is that, there's a question on that. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I I have part of the uh, Sustainable Population Australia. I want to give them a plug because if you want to uh, affect climate change, you can do things like you, you dry your clothes instead of using a you know using the sun instead of using a dryer. You can ride your bicycle instead of driving, and so on and so on. All of these things are dwarfed by orders of magnitude by the cost of an additional person on the planet, especially a wealthy uh, person like ourselves. 
So uh, in the current year, the government has uh, boosted immigration to absolutely insane levels, three to 400,000 people. And that's approximately the population of Canberra. And you think about what that's doing to the economy. People don't like the rates. And I didn't, something I could have said in my talk, but didn't. But uh, the cost of living, the cost of housing, when the cost of rent goes up, the uh, the demand for housing is absolutely insane. And yet and we've got some piecemeal policies that just deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We don't have a housing shortage problem. We have a population excess problem. Yeah, look, um, consumption growth is one of the fundamental problems. And we can divide consumption into two elements, consumption per person and the number of persons. And we really have to deal with them both. And the problem is that within Australia, that the the issue has been polluted by people like Pauline Hanson, um, who've turned it into a racism issue, a race issue, and it's not. If we're just talking about population, we're talking about on a finite planet, you, you can only have a finite number of people. And we have a current situation where we have growth in population and we have growth in consumption per Per person. Now, I have to modify that a bit. If you actually analyze it scientifically, the biggest contribution to our environmental impacts comes from consumption per person, from growth in con consumption per person. But growth in population also contributes quite significantly. Uh, and as Rod has said, it's the population of the rich countries, because every wealthy person, uh, and, and most of us in Australia are wealthy compared with um the global average well just look at the uh, yes. the productive farming land uh, is around our big cities and that's no accident because you build a city where there's good farming land and what gets swallowed up first as the as that city spills across its borders uh or the productive land around the fringes of sydney and melbourne and even the tiny bit of productive land really high productive land in canberra is going to be swallowed up by housing uh, we're running out of water in Australia. Like mm -hmm. I said, fresh water is one of the planetary boundaries. And we just think, oh, well, well, we'll keep having more people. We'll grow more food. Well, well that's not going to continue forever. And I, I think there are signs, Mark, you might pick me up on this, but that uh, productivity of uh, agriculture is really probably at about its peak and it's under threat from global warming. I'm conscious that time is moving on, so we probably yes. need to hear the remaining questions and try and answer them as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. So I think we might move on from, we've had a terrific 40-minute discussion about all the different things we have to do to try to make the kinds of change we're talking about. If we can just dig into a couple of, I've had a question about uh, two things. One person has asked, can you talk a bit more about degrowth? But if you could just hang on to that, uh, that's a recent question. Someone asked um, in a private message, I'm sorry, but I keep getting confused about job guarantee, UBI and UBS. Can you please remind me what they're about? And I think it's a nice, that, so um, if you guys would like to just talk about what universal basic income is versus services versus um, the job guarantee, can you explain to folks the differences? Well, universal basic income <clears throat> is that um, we do away with existing social security and we simply pay everyone a universal basic income, whether they're rich or poor or in between. And the problem with that is that it is very, very expensive. Uh, the advantage of a job guarantee is that it is a guarantee for people who can't, who want to find employment, can't find it in the market economy, and it gives them a basic income, but a real income and real training um, and is far less expensive. And well, there isn't really time to explain the, there are some real macroeconomic advantages too, because having, see the current, when you have boom and bust situation, the current economic system basically uses unemployment as a way of, of trying to handle that situation. But far better would be to use the job guarantee so that when the economy is doing really well and, and 
just about everyone is employed in the market economy, the job guarantee employs very few people. But if there's a recession, if the economy slows for various reasons, then more people are employed in in the um, job guarantee area. And they're doing valuable work, right? They're doing environmental remediation and so on. So that's job guarantee, universal basic income, and um, universal basic services. And I don't know if there was another universal, but I've seen, I've run out. I think there was the two. Actually, Claire's asked, don't we have that now with the welfare system? No, we don't no. have that now. Um, there's a lot of people who um, would like to work and do something of value for the community at large. And some people do it on a voluntary basis, um, but the argument is that valuable work for the community should be paid for. It should be part of the broader economy that goes beyond the market economy. You think of women's work. You think of caring work. You think of environmental remediation. So, no, it's it's not the existing system. It, it gives a much more secure system for everyone except, well, I think for everyone, actually, because it doesn't really compete with the market economy. The market economy is only interested in business activities that make a profit. And uh, can I could just give a quick give a quick plug we had gabrielle bond with us a moment ago i'm not sure if you're still here gabrielle but she and uh, stephen hale from torrens university or actually from the modern money lab run a weekend which i just did called rethinking capitalism a really good weekend and uh the universe the job guarantee is part of that so i sign up for that well worth it uh rod if you've got a link or any other info you'd like to put in the chat please do um, that's always helpful. Um, the other thing that you raised, Michelle, uh, among the questions is is a bit more on degrowth. And the justification for degrowth in the rich countries, not in the poor countries, is that, as Rod and I have been saying, we are exceeding the planetary boundaries in many areas and we're heading for destruction of our civilization. So we cannot, and consumption, whether it's the component of consumption is consumption per person or population, growth in consumption is taking us further towards the path of collapse. So we have to move to a steady state economy. That's the first step. And then if we recognize that the poorer countries will need a fair bit more economic activity and they will need to increase the use of energy and materials and land, then clearly something's got to give and what has to give really on an ethical basis is the rich countries have to degrow but not degrow in the sense of having a recession which just throws people out of work but having a planned degrowth process which keeps people who want to work in work and provides the, the basic services for everyone the universal basic services so what we're saying is we want to move to a more secure society, less risky for, for those who, who don't have political clout, for those who are disadvantaged in, in, in a whole range of ways. And so degrowth, planned degrowth, can be a very different thing from, from a recession. And there have now been a number of studies from different countries, from Canada, from France and from Europe on how we can actually create a degrowth society. Some of these studies have been macroeconomic models, which I'm very skeptical about, but there've also been studies on biophysical models. So looking at energy, materials, land, population, employment, and so on. And, and they find that if we do a whole range of policies, including shorter working week, including taxes for the rich instead of no taxes for the rich. And, and we introduce things like universal basic services and a job guarantee. In fact, it is possible to have full employment 
although it may not be five days a week, it may be four days a week employment, to have full employment and a good basic life for everyone who for everyone in the whole community. I, I would like to uh, add that, that uh, we are now running at about 1.6, 1.7 times the capacity of the planet. And if we don't limit ourselves, nature will do it for us and it won't be pretty. Can I pick up then on um, Michael's asked a great question. Who would be planning this degrowth? Can we talk very specifically about the role of government in ideal, not what's happening now? What ideally would a government do to do that deliberate contraction of economic and particularly material use and then the role of civil societies in um, and local communities? Can we talk a bit about that in the last three minutes before we start to wrap up? Okay, I'll be very quick. Um our treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has actually made a, a very small, tim, timid step in that direction by saying that GDP shouldn't be the only assessment in our community of well-being. We need a well-being economy. And the recent book by Robert Costanza discusses that in, in some detail. And that is a step in the right direction. We start, we no longer assess how we're doing by GDP, which does not take account of the difference between the rich and the poor. It does not take account of good economic activity versus bad economic activity. So that's the first step. And the second step is to expand basic services, better housing, public housing, public transport, public education. It's not that hard. It's not that radical because we can see countries like Denmark that have already gone a long way down that track. That's great. Thank you. Look, I think we might start to wrap up. Um, yeah, someone's just written Chalmers was lambasted for his thoughts. Yes, the tentative mm -hmm. steps towards something on well-being. We had a chat with Matt Grudnoff from the Australia Institute uh, a little earlier this year when we were doing the bu federal budget rundown. And that was one of my questions was mm -hmm. last year, the well-being budget was a, like a big discussion. And this year it had almost dissolved uh, and disappeared. But anyway, that's another discussion. Um just before we start to wrap up, I wonder if you might like to talk about what's coming next for you. Are you both spending time promoting the book, talking about these ideas? Uh, are you thinking about further uh, publications or ways of sharing? I know that you both write and talk a lot, um, but what's into the future for this kind of work that you're doing? Well, we're certainly both trying to get the, the ideas in the book out as widely as I can. And um I'm glad to see that we're both doing lots of talks around the country. Um, we haven't yet been su successful in actually getting the book mentioned on the ABC, which is very frustrating. Um, I found all my previous books were mentioned, but this one, which I think is the most important book that we've produced, <laughs> um, isn't getting that discussion. The other thing is that we're trying to publish, I'm trying to publish this paper that the group that I belong to of scientists and economists has written critiquing neoclassical economics. We want to get that published in a leading journal and then use that for popular debate and discussion, use that as a, as a credible basis for popular debate and discussion. And that's a really big challenge, challenging the economic system. But thanks to groups like Ayla and Nina and Cassie and uh, the ecological economics movement more broadly. I, I think we are moving in that direction, but we're we're still moving fairly slowly. And Rod, um, anything else you want to say about uh, the things that you're doing next? Or I, I often oh. ask people towards the end of a chat, you know, what are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? It's kind of hard to ask that after today's conversation, um, but feel free. <laughs> Well, I'm really impressed, and Mark and I are both really taken by the sort of response we're getting. So Mark had a booked out event in UNSW recently. Uh, we're both getting really strong reception. So that tells me that the time is right for the sorts of things that we cover in the book. Uh, That's great. So I put in the chat, I'll be doing a couple of talks coming up, one in November and Brisbane and one in October in Adelaide and keep writing. I'm working on a radio production at the moment for the ABC. Uh, if, if that goes well, that'll be able to share details of that soon. Excellent. 
nice to see that our little webinar has been promoted on your website. I'm just showing everyone the website for the book. And um, can we say, um, Michelle, that it's very hard to get our book through bookshops, but if you go to our website yep. that Rob created, sustainablecivilization.com, yep. um, you can see pathways for ordering. You can order both the ebook and the soft cover paperback book um, through that uh, online method, through going to the publisher, Palgrave or, or Springer Nature, that is a multinational corporation that owns Palgrave, <laughs> so it goes. Yep. But but our publishers don't normally sell through bookshops, so that's the best way to get it. Or to come to one of our talks when we bring copies and sell them at trade price, so <laughs> about forty or fifty percent below retail price uh, mm -hmm. at at our talks, as we did recently, Rob and I in in Wollongong, for example. So. Um, Come to the talks if you can, if we can get, we're trying to get around Australia. Uh, otherwise, please do, if you're interested, re have a look at our website to find out more about the book and you can order it then um, through the online method of ordering. Excellent. And I've put the link there again for everybody. Um, in a moment, we might just wrap up a little bit and I'll do a huge thank you to Rod and Mark for your um, marathon effort, a two hour webinar um, to discuss these really important issues. But first, I just want to give a quick plug. Do visit the new Economy Network Australia website. There's a special page for our Economics for the Earth this week. You'll be able to see uh, that we've already got some of the recordings up from earlier this week. Some people were asking about them. There's the lovely talk by Mary Graham, um, discussion about aspects of degrowth. Um, last night, I had an amazing conversation with um, a regenerative ecological design guru, Daniel Christian Vahl. Um, that was really amazing. This uh, the lovely lunchtime session. And tonight, I'll be in conversation with um, Robert Costanza. Um, I'm going to put him on the spot and ask him what the heck is going on with ecological economics. Why hasn't it become the thing we all needed it to be? Where's it going? Um, and um, what what's the good stuff that's going on right now? So I hope you can join us for that. And if you're interested in further discussions and amazingness, we've still got two more weeks of Earth Laws Month. So it's a lot more Earth-centered discussions, everything from deep ecology to a climate change update with Griffith Climate Beacon, a wonderful, wonderful human being, Professor Brendan Mackey on Monday, really giving us an update on what the current science is telling us, what it means for our local places, regions, and the nation itself. And there's so much more. Um, but I think that's all the advert I needed to do. Um, and to be a really great host, look, we're one minute away from closing time. Let's wrap it up. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you lovely humans who've joined us for two hours and a really big thank you to Rod and Mark, not just for joining us today, but for your decades of hard work, for your many publications and discussions and for this book, which I think offers some really important discussions and ideas about, particularly for me, the political mess that our so-called democracy is in and some of the good things that we can do about it. So I'll leave you with the final word. If you'd just like to say goodbye, thank you, or sing a song, whatever you wish, over to you. <laughs> Australians all <laughs> let us. No. Well, I, I'm paid to not sing. Well, uh, great big thank you, Michelle. You're a powerhouse and uh, you're putting a huge amount of work in, so good on you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everyone who participated in this um, event and please become more active join a group if you haven't already because as individuals we're not very powerful but in a larger group we can do a lot more and it's very rewarding to be part of a group that is working in in the common for the common good and not for profit mm. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much again, Rod, Mark, and everybody. And hopefully we'll see you again soon for another really important conversation. Good luck out there. Keep up the hard work, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.